اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان اللعین الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمدللہ بار الخلائق الاجمعین باعث الانبیاء والمرسلین ثم الصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبیاء حبیب قلوبنا وشفیع ذنوبنا ابی القاسم محمد ثم الصلاة والسلام على اہل بیته الطیبین الطاہرین المعصومین المذلومین لا سیما ولی اللہ الحجت ابن الحسن صاحب الامر والزمان اللہم صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم اللہم صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم روحی و عرواح العالمین له الفداء ولعنت اللہ علی اعدائهم اجمعین من الاولین والآخرین الى قیام یوم الدین آمین رب العالمین اما بعد قال رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وآلہ وسلم فی حق اخیہ ووزیرہ امیر المؤمنین برز الایمان کلوہ علی الشرک کلوہ صدق النبی وآمنا بہ نورو مجالسکم بذکر محمد و آل محمد احبائی you find in the entire history of Islam that there were only two just governments that represented the values and incorporated the message of the entire Anbiya on earth. The first one being the government of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajjul faraja. which Rasulullah implemented upon his hijrah from Makkah towards Medina and as he established himself in the city of Medina for a period of 10 years this is the first time that human history has seen a dawla, a government of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with all its majesty and with all its grandeur and at the very head of this government Rasulullah and the second time that mankind in this dunya has seen the majestic government of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on earth, the rule of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on earth, is when the Zahiri Khilafah was granted to Amir al Mu'mineen upon the death and the assassination of Uthman ibn Affan. And the third time the world is going to witness this majestic government in which peace, justice, and prosperity shall flourish across the entire earth from the east, east to the west is the government of our awaited Imam Maulana Imam Sahib Al Amri Was Zaman. And in honor of Amir al Mu'mineen, Ruhi Lahu al Fidah, on a night like this, Ahibai Shabab, it is absolutely important for us to take lessons and to learn about the principles of divine governance as per the madrasa of Amir al Mu'mineen. For indeed, from the trials and the tribulations that we witness in the earth today, politics in the name of Islam, Oppression in the name of Islam, rising to power in the name of Islam, manipulation of the citizens of the state in the name of Islam. This religion, particularly within the realm of politics, has become nothing but a tool 
to manipulate the masses and ascend and hold wealth. And in fact, there is no greater insult to Islam than the manipulation of Islam and the use of religion to ascend to power. And once they ascend to power, they themselves destroy the religion in a manner that even the enemies from the outside could not destroy Islam. And hence, for us, not only is it a matter of pride that the Imam that you affiliate with, the one around whom your identity revolves, for the Shia, his identity revolves around the Mirul Mu'mineen like the way the Hujjaj circumambulate around the Kaaba during Hajj. And hence it is important for us to understand these divine principles of governance. Number one, in whom you feel proud that this is the Imam that you affiliate yourselves with. And number two, that we are able to educate the entire world and not only the Muslim Ummah, the general world, that the answers to the world's global problems lie within the principles of governance preached and practiced and implemented by Amirul Mu'mineen. To be able to distinguish true Islam from the version that is far from that which is revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tonight primarily is a night of Masa'ib. And before we begin the recitation of the Maktal, I wish to spend some time to discuss two policies of governance within the government of Amirul Mu'mineen. And these are supposed to be the founding pillars of any governmental organization that has established itself in the name of Islam or that claims to be Islamic. We begin with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Hadith is Sharif Ahbai, when we study the principles of Islamic governance, particularly from the time of Amirul Mu'mineen, it is important that when we analyze these hadith and we study these hadith, there are two lenses through which you are able to analyze Amirul Mu'mineen. Number one, you look at Amirul Mu'mineen and you study Amirul Mu'mineen through the lens of a divinely appointed Imam and a Khalif of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And on the other hand, there is a lens through which we need to understand and analyze the life of Amirul Mu'mineen and this is the lens of a head of state, somebody who is in power and in charge of the direction of the Ummah. Shufu Ahiba'i, this is the first khutbah granted by Amirul Mu'mineen when the Zahiri Khilafah was granted to him. Bain al Qawsain, as you already know, between brackets, for us an Imam is an Imam and a leader, regardless of whether the apparent reigns of Khilafah are given to him or not given to him. Ma'soom Imam is an Imam regardless. And the Imam runs a government, whether he's in power or not in power. In any case, when this Zahiri Khilafah was granted to Amirul Mu'mineen, Ruhi Lahul Fida, the first speech granted, the first khutbah granted by Amirul Mu'mineen in the city of Kufa. This is after the battle of Jamal, when Aisha, together with the support of the likes of Talha and Zubair, engaged Amirul Mu'mineen. In a civil war. And it is important that we look at the likes of the people of Talha and Zubair. And we were saying this last night with a few of the Shabab, the likes of Talha and Zubair, Ahibai. These were people who were with Amirul Mu'mineen from the very beginning. And between them, Talha and Zubair, one of them was also in the house of Amirul Mu'mineen during the time of Saqifa. And they were protecting Amirul Mu'mineen before the house was burnt down. In fact, Umar ibn Khattab removed him and broke his sword and took him out. He was with Amirul Mu'mineen. Subhanallah, the moment Amirul Mu'mineen got government, 
the hands of government the reins of government reached him and amirul mu'minin decided that there is no room for any sort of nepotism there is no room for any type of favoritism there is no room for preferential treatment within the government talha and zubair switched allegiances bearing the justice of the imam requires total submission which is why if you refer back to the books of ghaiba that have been authored by the likes, likes of Sheikh Nu'mani or Sheikh Tusi, you will find that from amongst the biggest fitnas that will happen upon the zuhur of the Imam is going to be the fitna which is internal. Those people who spent their entire time saying, Allahumma kulli waliyika al hujja, Allahumma ajil li waliyika al hujja, are going to be the same ones who are the front line of opposition towards Imam al hujja. Hadol, and these are the people who are going to come and say, Tashunu, Ana in the ghayba, we are the ones who ran the religion, we are the ones who managed this deen while enter you are in ghaiba today we are going to take orders from you you are not going to consult us submission to the imam requires total submission of the nafs and you find it is those people who failed in this aspect of the deen who ended up becoming frontline opposition towards the a'imma and to fadlan and rasulullah in any case, the civil war happens, Amir al muminin shifts the capital for strategic reasons from the city of Medina al munawwara to Kufa. He comes into Kufa, the capital city, and he delivers this khutbah. فَأَحْنَا أَحِبَّائِي We want to view this khutbah through the second lens, in that we are looking at Amir al muminin as a head of state. And this is the first presidential speech being given by a head of state of the Islamic Ummah upon attaining the reign of government. Look at what Amir al muminin says. He enters into Kufa and he gathers the people around Masjid al-Nabawi. He says to them, this is the first presidential speech of Amir al muminin دخلت بلادكم بأشمال هذه ورحلتي وراحلتي ها هي فإن أنا خرجت من بلادكم بغير ما دخلت فإني من الخائنين أمير المؤمنين first presidential speech and I keep emphasizing and repeating on this to emphasize the importance and to me have seen when a president gets elected the inaugurational speech looks like what the entire population has gotten together state officials officials from the previous government Madri Shuno all the important people are over there Amir al muminin in a similar setting comes forward and says that I have entered into your city and these are my belongings. The hadith narrate that he came and migrated from Medina towards Kufa on about three or four camels. He had his family members with him and he had his possessions with him on his camel. Pay attention. He had his possessions with him on his camels. And then he says to the people, Hadihi Rihlati wa rahilati Ha hiya rahilati wa rihlati These are my possessions for everybody to see And then he goes on to say that if I leave the position of office with anything more than what I have come into with know that I am from amongst the traitors and from over here, Ahibai, Riwaya is one thing, Diraya is another thing altogether. Understanding the hadith and istidlal of hadith through which we are able to extract the principles of Islamic governance. And today we want to understand the depth of the words of Amirul Mu'mineen. Number one, Amirul Mu'mineen alayhi salam is saying, that this is my wealth that if I leave office with anything more than that that I have come with then I am guilty of treason 
From here, Shabab, the first thing we are able to understand within the principles of Islamic governance is that political leadership is not an office through which wealth is accumulated. Whether the accumulation of wealth is through a high governmental salary which is paid out of the money of the hard-earned people's taxes because the governmental salary is based on what majority of the time governmental salary is either paid from financial revenue earned either from state-owned assets and state-owned assets is not something which is condoned within Islamic economics especially when you look at the principles of macroeconomics as per the school of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam the school Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad Our madhab is not in favor of state owned corporations and this is a discussion in Kawaid al Fiqhiyah perhaps for another day or from state owned resources la but government income that is paid by way of salary through taxes collected from the people the taxes of the people cannot be a source for the accumulation of a personal fortune this is the first thing amirul mu'minin has laid forward in terms of condition anyone willing to run for a government position within an islamic government accumulation of wealth should not be an objective cannot be an objective else it is considered treason number two a person who is in position of power within government an islamically run government does not have the right to increase his personal fortunes even by benefiting from the networking and the connections that he builds whilst he is in office because somebody may come and say that they have come into power that i didn't take a salary from the government and i didn't increase my wealth through the taxpayers money and that i did not take any public resource but what the leader of the government did is that he used the connections and the networks exploiting the position of power in which he is in order to build a fortune even that within the principles of amir al-mu'minin is considered treason and notice how amir al-mu'minin says that i am guilty of treason do you know treason in this context is punishable by death which means that a head of state is not above the judicial system how many today look into politics current day politics how many governments in the world claim to be islamic and how many of them endorse principles like these in terms of heads of states Furthermore, you look at the words of Amir al-Mu'minin carefully. Amir al-Mu'minin in this opening presidential speech, he says, "Dakhaltu biladakum bi ashmali hadhihi." See the words of the Amir are absolutely accurate and the very very precise the choice of words. "Dakhaltu biladakum bi ashmali hadhihi." وَرِحْلَتِي وَرَاحِلَتِي هَاهِيَةً So when he came into Masjid Al-Kufa and he says that I have come here as a leader and this is my personal fortune. Yani he pointed out to his personal wealth, his personal fortune, هَاهِيَةً Meaning that he has put his entire private property, whatever he owns in his possessions in front of the people to see. 
This is exactly what I own. So if I leave office with more than I have, then I'm guilty of treason. What does it mean when Amir al-Mu'minin says, Ha hiya, ahibai, he has brought his entire wealth for the people to come and see. Meaning in our day and age by way of istidlal, one of the things we are able to deduce is that a person in power within an Islamic government is obliged to a public audit of his wealth. Because this is what Amir al-Mu'mineen said. He said, ha here, this is everything that I own. These are my utensils, these are my clothes, these are my camels, this is X, this is Y, this is Z. A public audit of my wealth. And then he goes on to say, if I have left office and I have anything more than this, then I am guilty of treason. Which means that the head of state is subject to two public audits. One when he enters into office and the second when he is leaving office, he is subject to a public audit. Leading in the name of Islam is not something that is simple. It's not something to be manipulated. And it is through policies such as these that Amir al Mu'mineen laid the foundation and created an environment for governmental functions to be at zero corruption. Ahibai, this is not utopia. This is when accountability begins with the nafs and the self. Amir al Mu'mineen was not one of those head of states who led up to power, who raised up or raised up to power and then began to hold those underneath him to be accountable. He didn't exert governmental resources to see whether the population is paying their dues or not. He held himself to a high level of accountability before holding anyone else to accountability. And if you were to refer back to the Nahjul Balagha, you would see that when it came to collecting taxes and dues from the people, Amir al Mu'mineen was far more lenient when it came to the people and was extremely harsh when it came to government officials of his own. If a government official demonstrated ownership of wealth more than what his appointed salary would be able to give, he was held under a commissioning which was absolutely harsh under Amir al Mu'mineen. Yet when it came to the masses who would fall short in paying the dues, Amirul Mu'mineen would exercise clemency with them. In Tumshufu within Nahjul Balagha, the guidelines that are given to the taxpayers, or the guidelines that are given to the tax collectors, the arm of the government, which is tasked with collecting the taxes, look at the level of akhlaq and humility they are expected to have before they even come and ask for the dues. Even though the dues are the dues of Allah, but an Islamic government is something that has sublime moral principles. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Shabab, these are principles of government that need to be studied within political science. And when it comes to universities, academic institutions, where politics is being discussed, solutions to global problems are being discussed, it is important that we are able to give a voice and a platform to the divine principles of governance that are set by Amir al-Mu'mineen. This is one. The head of state is subject to a public audit Number one, the beginning of his term, at the end of his term. Number two, the head of state has no right to take a position or the position of government is not a position which can be exploited to increase personal wealth or a personal fortune, be it directly through salary or indirectly through the manipulation of networks and connections. Number two, this was a khutbah given by Amir al-Mu'mineen towards 
the end of his life. Towards the end of his reign in government for a period of four to five years, Amir al-Mu'mineen has been subject to three civil wars. The Battle of Jamal, the Battle of Siffin, and the Battle of Naharwan. And to truly appreciate Amir al-Mu'mineen ahibai, and to me have seen, even in contemporary history, that when a government goes through a civil war, or any government is subjected to war, how long does it take to build, rebuild the country, rebuild the infrastructure, rebuild confidence for investors to come in, rebuild confidence for traders to start? These are all things that Amir al-Mu'mineen spoke about. If you refer back to the very famously narrated letter of Amir al-Mu'mineen to Malik al-Ashtar, and you look at the guidance that Amir al-Mu'mineen gives to Malik al-Ashtar, how to take care of the traders and the businessmen and the entrepreneurs, because these are the cornerstones of the economy. And yet, much as they are the cornerstone of the economy, the trader and the entrepreneur being profit-driven has this inside of him where he moves towards the right and moves towards the left and looks for corners around the religion. Amir al-Mu'mineen gives Malik al-Ashtar guidance on how to deal with these people. You find that it is absolutely difficult to rebuild a country after war. You find that countries may take decades in order to rebuild themselves. For you can imagine in a short period of four to five years, Amir al-Mu'mineen has been subject to three civil wars. But despite this, look at the achievements of Amir al-Mu'mineen. He says this, with his own blessed mouth towards the end of his life, in one of the days where he is sitting in Masjid al-Kufa, he says to his companions, ما أصبح بالكوفة أحد إلا نائما إن أدناهم منزلة. أمير المؤمنين says, looking at the city of Kufa, there is not a single person in Kufa who wakes up except that he is encompassed in the bounties of Allah, and indeed. The most lowest person, Adna Manzilatan, and it will come back to this word. Inna Adna Hum Manzilatan, the person with the lowest level, the person at the lowest level of the economic strata. La Yaqul al Burr, wa Yajlis fi Dil, wa Yashrub min ma il Furat. Amir al Mu'mineen says, the least well off person in Mecca. The minimum that he has is that he has wheat through which he can eat. He has a roof over his head and he has access to clean drinking water from Furat. Look at what Amir al-Mu'mineen is saying over here. Despite three civil wars, the economic policies implemented by Amir al-Mu'mineen were such that there was not a single household in the city of Kufa except that, at, except that it had enough wheat to eat. A government of zero hunger. And this is Amir al-Mu'minin who's been faced by three civil conflicts. Meaning that reduction of poverty is a direct goal of the head of state. And the head of state is responsible for measuring the level of poverty when he enters into office. And when he's coming out of office such that we are able to see the impact act that he has had on the standard of living of the people that he is responsible for. There is not a single person in Kufa except that he is a homeowner. Do you know 
within the principles of economics as per the teachings of Imam Sadiq salam, the rental market for housing is one of the most despised markets a rental market is not something which is propagated and encouraged by Ahlul Bayt home ownership is equivalent to a birthright for every citizen of state because within the principles of Islamic governance and Islamic economics ownership of land land belongs to Allah and the dwellers of the earth the government by way of urban planners their only right is to facilitate the allocation of land as per necessity they are not owners of the land and hence in Islam there is nothing like a land tax and you'll be surprised you know, when you see the reappearance of the 12th Imam and you see the Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajjal faraja and you see this verse of the Quran come to life إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْ وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ Afwaja in their millions in their millions entering into the deen because the Imam the awaited Imam will come forward with solutions at a global level that cancel out land tax and even if people don't enter into Islam because of faith initially they enter into Islam because there is a Masliha Deeniya or Masliha Dunyawiya and this Dunyawi Masliha then takes them towards the deen Homelessness and tackling homelessness was something that Amir al Mu'minin eradicated through the eradication of land tax. And similarly, when you come and you see what Amir al Mu'minin says, min ma'il furat, there is not a single household in Kufa except that they have access to clean drinking water from the Furat which means that Amir al-Mu'mineen had implemented policies where water from the river Furat will be rechanneled such that every house in Kufa has access to water not only through the rechannelment of water supplies from the main Furat into the houses and into the urban setting but in addition to that Amir al-Mu'mineen had put together policies environmental policies to make sure that the water of Furat is not polluted and that water is suitable for consumption and for drinking this is the Islam of Rasulullah this is the Islam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed and the Islam at a governmental level that no other Khalifa other than Amir al muminin has implemented. And this is why we say that one of the biggest signs if a person is blind to if a person is blind to all the verses within the Holy Quran that speak about the wilaya of Amir al Mu'mineen. Look at the governance of Amir al Mu'mineen, the policies of Amir al Mu'mineen, the achievement of Amir al Mu'mineen, the achievement in itself will tell you that this is not possible to be attained except by an individual who is selected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is important over here that we have a holistic understanding of Amir al Mu'mineen. If it came to a statesman, there is an un, there is no other person who can come close to governance like Amir al Mu'mineen. When it came to the achievement of the Ummah, there was no one who has come close to Amir al Mu'mineen. If there is a statesman who represents the values of Allah, it is Amir al Mu'mineen. If there is anyone in Ilm who represents the the tafsir of the Quran that encaptures the intended meanings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in its entirety. It is Amirul Mu'mineen. If there is any other warrior on a battlefield who can be the lion of Allah on earth such that his jihad is so in Hence, a sword comes down from the heaven and Jibreel says, 
فتى إلا علي لا سيف إلا ذو الفكر يا علي 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 مولا يا علي This person who went into the battlefield when no other person was willing to enter into the battlefield. Rasulullah says, Barazal Iman Kullu ala shirki kulli. The entirety of Iman is Ali. The statement who is a state, the statesman who is the statesman of Allah. The warrior who is the warrior of Allah. The Alim who is the Alim of Allah. The Abid who is the Abid of Allah. Allah raised his status to such an extent. Rasulullah says, Dhikru Ali Ibadah. And on a night like this, Ahibai, as we ask for your hajats, as we ask for our hajats, our elders in the house say one of the biggest things that you should do on a night like this is truly thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the ni'mah of the wilayah of Amirul Mu'mineen. Wallahi, wallahi and tallahi, a qasam on the member of Amirul Mu'mineen. Miskeen is the one who doesn't have the love of Amirul Mu'mineen. The greatest ni'mah is the ni'mah of Amir al-Mu'mineen. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this ni'mah. And to pray for the continuity of this ni'mah. Not only within us, but within our children and our lineages. To live by the principles of Amir al-Mu'mineen in our lives, ahibai. Much as love is important and necessary, bila shakin wala raib. But this love needs to propel us towards acting in the ways and as per the teachings of Amirul Mu'mineen, Ruhi Lahul Fida. And to be able to invite others towards the wilaya of Amirul Mu'mineen. Having said this, Ahibai. I want to begin the recitation of the maktal for you. And the idea is that we want to relive the final moments of Amirul Mu'mineen. We want to relive the final moments of Amirul Mu'mineen. And much as you are here in this blessed barga in Nairobi, Ahibai, I want you to take your hearts to the city of Kufa, to the city of Najaf. Allah, this is the Mi'raj of the heart in Shahrul Ramadan to Najaf and to Kufa. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant all of us the opportunity to perform the ziyarah of Amirul Mu'mineen, Ya Allah. And to provide us with the shafa'a of Amirul Mu'mineen on the day of judgment. And to be able to drink from the blessed pond of Kawthar on the day of judgment. May on this night, Ahibai, take your hearts to Kufa. And those of you who have done ziyara, you know the house of Amirul Mu'mineen? Huh? It is as if you are seated in a corner 
of the house of Amirul Mu'mineen and you are watching these events unfold in front of you. All of this with a salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. <coughs> Muhammad ibn Hanafi narrates that on the 20th of Shahrul Ramadan due to the intensity of the poison and the intensity of the strike when Ibn Muljim struck Amir al muminin while he was in a state of sajda the impact of the strike and the intensity of the poison was such that the poison had began to affect the legs of Amir al muminin His legs were so swollen such that Amir al muminin was not even able to stand up for Salat. So he would be reciting Salat on the 20th of Shahrul Ramadan while he was seated. Sometimes he would be gaining consciousness, sometimes he would be fainting due to the intensity of the pain. Muhammad ibn Hanafiya says, that on the 20th day of Shahrul Ramadan, all the people of Kufa gathered around the house. They were looking to pay their final respects and to give their final salams to Amir al Mu'minin. Imam Hassan al Mujtabab stood at the door and he began to allow the people to come one by one and pay their respects to Amir al Mu'minin. As they would enter into the house, Amir al Mu'minin in a very faint voice would say to them Saluni kabla antafqiduni ask me for indeed ask me before you lose me faha huna sahtul ilm for indeed in this chest is the knowledge of everything that Allah has revealed wa khaffifu su'alakum li musibati imamikum and ensure that you limit your questions due to the trials and the tribulations the pains of your imam the people would enter into the house they would enter into the room of amirul mu'minin they would do their salams they would ask their questions and then they would leave as soon as they leave another group of people enter and this continued for the entire day until amirul mu'minin began became extremely weak so imam hassan al mujtaba asked the people to return back to their houses to give Amir al a little bit time to recover. All the people were returned back to their houses except for one companion by the name of Asbah ibn Nabata and another companion by the name of Hujar ibn Adi. Both of them were sitting at the doorstep of Amir al and they were weeping and crying. Imam Hassan al mujtaba says to them, O oh Asbah, O oh Hujar, did I not tell you to go back Back to your homes they said ya Abba Muhammad if you can give us only one more opportunity to visit our Imam Imam al Mujtaba agreed so Hujari bin Adi went in when he saw the state of Amir al Mu'minin he began to weep and cry Amir al Mu'minin opened his eyes he said to him O oh, Hijar you cry over me Imam, Imam Amir al Mu'minin says to Hijar you cry over me Hijr said to him, Mawla, how can I not cry when you are the epitome of perfection and this is what the Ummah has done to you? So Amirul Mu'mineen smiled at Hujar and he said to him, O oh, Hujar, what will you do when you are in a similar situation? Hujar said, What ya Mawla? Amirul Mu'mineen says to him, O oh, Hijr, there will come a time during the time of Muawiyah when you will be arrested and they will make you do la'na towards me. When that happens, Hijr, what will you do? Hijr's tears began rolling down his cheeks. He said, Ya Amir al muminin for me it is better that I was cut into swords, into pieces. I was cut by swords into pieces. Hujar says, La athartu an akta an okta bisayfi irban irba. I would rather be cut into pieces by a 
sword and I would rather be thrown into a burning fire than to send the la'ana upon you. So Amirul Mu'minin, with all his pain faintly smiled and he said, O oh, Hajar, if you do this then congratulations for indeed you are from the successful ones. Allah, Allah, after a little while Asbag ibn Nabata entered into the house when he saw Amirul Mu'minin, Asbag ibn Nabata began to weep and cry. Huh? Asbag ibn Nabata says, when I entered into the chamber and I looked at Amirul Mu'minin, Asbag ibn Nabata says, I saw there was a white bandage that was tied around the head of Amirul Mu'minin. Asbag says, I don't know what was more whiter, what was more paler, the complexion of Amirul Mu'minin or the whiteness of the bandage. He says, I saw Amirul Mu'minin was in so much pain. He was in so much pain that while lying down on the bed, he was raising one leg and then putting it down and raising another leg. Allah, Allah, today when I read this in the Masaib, Shabab, it reminded me of the Masaib of another youth in Karbala when he was struck by the sword. Allah, Allah, this is the Masaib of Shah Qasim when he was struck on the head. The strike was so intense when Imam Al Hussein reached Qasim. Qasim was moving his legs up and down. <laughs> Ajrakumullah ala Allah, may your reward be by Allah for the tears that you shed for Amirul Mu'minin. Help Imam al hujja and weep with Imam al hujja on a night like this. Asbag ibn Nabata says that Amirul Mu'minin was moving his legs up and down out of pain. Asbag says, I sat by Amirul Mu'minin and then he gently turned towards me and he said, Asbag, ask me, Allah, even in this stage, Sahib Saluni is saying, Saluni, ask me. Asbag ibn Nabata said to him, Ya Amir al muminin I wish to hear one more hadith from you. At this time, Amir al muminin said, Oh Asbag, this is the final tradition and the final hadith that you will hear from your Mawla. So Asbag went a little bit close to the mouth of Amir al muminin And Amir al muminin said to him, Oh Asbag, the final tradition that you hear from me, is a tradition that I heard from Rasulullah where Rasulullah my brother said Ya Ali, you and I are the two fathers of this Ummah. So may the la'na of Allah be upon those who have violated the rights of the Father in this Ummah. Asbag ibn Nabata began to weep, so Imam Hassan al Mujtaba escorted him out of the house. Allah, Allah. Muhammad ibn Hanafiya says that on a night like this, the 21st night of Shahrul Ramadan, I saw my father Amirul Mu'mineen he has gathered all the children and all the family members together and the intensity of the poison was such that the swelling in the legs of Amirul Mu'mineen had become worse from the previous night. His legs were extremely swollen. The complexion of Amirul Mu'mineen was pale but his legs had become red due to the intensity of the poison. He would be fainting for a part of the night and gaining consciousness for another part of the night until there came a portion of the night Amirul Mu'minin gathered all his children around him and then he said to them this is my wasiya for my children and this is a wasiya for my Ahlul Bayt this is a wasiya for all my Shias to whom my words shall reach Allah Allah Shi'at Amirul Mu'minin 
mean this is a wasiya from our master to us on a night like this these are the final words of amirul mu'minin to you and i so he gathers all the children and he says this is my wasiya ashhadu allah ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh arsalahu bil huda wa din al haq liyudhhirahu ala al din kulluh ولو كره المشركون إن الصلاة ونسك ومحيا يا ومامات لله رب العالمين. I bear witness that there is no god but Allah. رسول الله is the final messenger. Sent him with the message of truth that shall encompass the entire globe. ولو كره المشركون. أمير المؤمنين then says and I bear witness that my entire your life my my entire worship and my salat is for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then he turned towards imam hasan and imam al hussein and he said to them ittaqullah wa la ittaqullah wa la tabghiya ad dunya wa in baghatkum oh my two sons hasan and hussein have taqwa and do not be deceived by the dunya even if the dunya comes running behind you do not be deceived by its attraction and then he says to them wa kuna lil zalimi khasman wa lil madlumi awnan and i want you in your lives that you should always be an opponent to the oppressor and that you should always be a helper for those who have been oppressed and then he looked towards all his children He looked towards all his children, and then he began to give them wasiyas and testimonies one by one, words of guidance to them. Until he began with the other part of the advice in his khutbah, Amir al-Mu'minin says to his children, "Allah, Allah, wal Quran. By Allah, hold on to the Quran and ensure that nobody recites the Quran or nobody precedes you in following the Quran." meaning that you should be at the very forefront when it comes to the recitation and the implementation of the Quran it says allah allah fil quran allah allah fis salat by allah hold on to your salat fa innaha amududdin indeed the salat is the central pillar of your religion allah allah fis zakat by allah pay attention to your zakat fa indeed it extinguishes the anger of allah 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 fi siyam shahr ramadan by allah hold on and adhere to the divinity of shahr ramadan for indeed innaha jannatun min an-nar it is a shield from the fire of jahannam and then amirul mu'minin says allah allah fi jiranikum by allah ensure the rights of your neighbors allah allah fil masakin wal fuqara by allah ensure that you give the people in poverty the poor people their rights allah allah fil aitam by allah ensure that you give the orphans their rights make sure they are not hungry while your bellies are full and then amirul mu'minin says allah allah fi dhurriyati nabiyyikum la yudlamunna bayna adharikum by allah take care of the ahl bayt of rasulullah ensure that they are not oppressed whilst they are amongst you and then amirul mu'minin says that when you are in the way of Allah la ta'khudhukum law matala'i min fillah that if you are in working in the way of Allah you should not care about the opinions of those who are astray but hold firm on the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then he looked at Imam Hasan al-Mujtaba and he said to him o oh, Imam Hasan you are now my khalifa and now you are the one who is going to be my my successor and you are the one who is in charge of the entire family he looked towards his children and he said after me the authority is abu muhammad hasan al mujtaba so abide by his authority and then he called abul fadl al abbas and he called say 
سيدة زينب and he put the hand of Abu Fadl on the hand of Sayyida Zainab and he said all my children are under the care of Hassan al-Mujtaba but Zainab Zainab is in your care Abu Fadl Allah 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 and then he took the hands of Abu Fadl he kissed the two arms of Abu Fadl and he said to him Abbas you were going to be my representative on the day of Ashura ensure that if you reach the Furat you do not drink from the water of the Furat I say Ya Amir al Mu'minin, the jihad of Abu Fadl on the day of Ashura he protected he protected protected Hussein he reached the Furat Ya Amir al muminin Abu Fadl lifted the water but he didn't drink from the water Abu Fadl Ya Amir al muminin you kissed the arms of Abu Fadl but come to Karbala do you know when they severed the arms of Abu Fadl and an enemy hit him with a tent pole do you know how Abu Fadl fell on the ground the Maktal says Abbas fell fell Face first. There was an arrow in the eye. She had a mirror moment in. When Abu Fadil fell, the arrow pushed forward even deeper. Ya Amir al Mu'minin, Abu Fadl will do you proud on the day of Ashura. Allah. He kissed the arms of Abu Fadl and he said to him, Do not drink water on the day of Ashura. And then over here, Sayyidah Zainab called out to Amir al Mu'minin and she said to him, Oh Amir al Mu'minin, Um Ayman used to tell me that I'm going to be taken as captive and that I'm going to be taken as prisoner. Is that true? Amir al Mu'minin, tears rolling down his cheeks, he said, Zainab, it is as if I can see you being brought into Kufa with ropes around your wrists and the rope around your neck. He said, Amir al Mu'minin, when she was entering into the Darbar of Kufa, Shimmer was whipping Zainab. He gave the testimony to the children. Imam al Hussein then, Amir al Mu'minin then looked at Imam al Hussein and he said to him, Ya Aba Abdullah, you are the shaheed of this Ummah and you will be beheaded. Your jugular veins shall be severed and your head will be raised on a spear from city to city. <laughs> He then looked at Imam Hassan al-Mujtaba and he said to him, Abba Muhammad, you will then be poisoned by this Ummah until you will be coughing out blood and pieces of your inside. So I say to you, O oh my family, sabr and sabr, have patience, for indeed Allah is wise and Allah is just and retribution should surely be meted out towards your enemies. Amir al Mu'minin then turned towards Imam Hassan al Mujtaba and he said to him, O oh my son Abu Muhammad, if I am to die, I want you to give me the ghusl and I want you to give me the hunut and I want you to give me the kafan. The narrations mention that the hunut that was brought for Amir al Mu'minin, this was a hunut from the leftovers of Jannah. It was brought down when Sayyida Khadija had become Shahida. So this hunut was used for five people. This hunut was used for five people. It was used for Umm al Mu'minin, Sayyida Khadija. It was used for Rasulullah. The remainder then was used for Sayyida Fatima al Zahra. And then a part of it was used for Amirul Mu'mineen. And the last remaining fifth of the Hunut was used for Imam Hassan al Mujtaba. Somebody asks, Where is the Hunut of Abu Abdullah? Allah, Allah. This Imam al Hussein in Karbala, three days without a ghusl and a kafir. The ulama used to say, Our elders in the house, that even if the Hunut remained, what was remaining from the body of Imam Abdullah? <laughs> Oh, 
أمير المؤمنين says give me the ghusl give me the kafan and give me the hunut إمام حسن المجتبى says when I was giving ghusl to my father أمير المؤمنين he says I saw the entire body of my father covered in wounds and scars from the battles that he fought in from the top of his head all the way down to his legs أمير المؤمنين's body was covered in scars from all the battles that he had been present in and Imam Hassan al-Mujtaba says there was not a single scar on the back of Amir al-Mu'mineen and this is because Amir al-Mu'mineen would never turn his back towards the enemies during war Allah so Amir al-Mu'mineen says oh Imam Abu Muhammad my son Imam Hassan give me the ghusl give me the hunut and give me the kafan when I die and when you place my body into the tabut lift the tabut from the back because from the front the two angels Jibrail and Mikail will carry my tabut from Kufa they will lead the janaza and the tabut from Kufa they will lead the tabut and the janaza towards Najaf and then wherever the angels put down my tabut O oh Abba Muhammad you will see that there is a grave that is already dug by Nabiullah No, I want you to put me and lay me down in my cover O oh Hassan when you lay me in my cover I want you to conceal all traces of my my grave do you know why Amir al muminin said cover the traces of my grave because the khawarij of the time if they had an opportunity they would pull out and exhume the body of Amir al muminin so he said to him oh my son Hassan cover the trace of the grave and you should return back to your house and give comfort to Zainab and Umm Kulthum and then Amir al muminin after giving this wasiya he appointed Imam Hassan al-Mujtaba as the final Imam after him yani his as the Imam and the successor after him he gave Imam Hassan al-Mujtaba the Dhulfiqar and then he gave Imam Hassan al-Mujtaba the ring of Aqiq he gave Imam Hassan al-Mujtaba the Mus'haf and the Quran that he had compiled he designated him as the Imam and gave him instructions on what should be done in the office of an Imam at and then Amirul Mu'mineen fainted. He would then come into consciousness, go out of consciousness. Allah, Allah, Ya Shi'at Ali. These are the final moments of Amirul Mu'mineen. Al-Wida, Al-Wida, Ya Amir Al-Mu'mineen. Al-Wida, Al-Wida, Ya Haydar Al-Karrar. Amirul Mu'mineen then opened his eyes. He looked towards his family members for for a final time he saw Hassan and Hussein Zainab and Umm Kulthum Abu Al-Fadil Umm Al-Baneen all of them crying Amir al muminin then with a very faint voice looked up towards the heavens he then said here I can see my brother Rasul Allah I can see my brother Jafar here is my father Abu Talib here is my my uncle Hamza the narration then mentions Faistakbal al Kibla Amirul Mu'minin laid down facing the Kibla Wagamada Aine Amirul Mu'minin closed his eyes Wa Asbala Yaday He straightened up his hands Wa Madada Rijlay He straightened out his legs the sweat of death began to drop down the forehead of Amir al muminin He then, in a very fine voice, began to say, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah. Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. As soon as the Amir recited the Shahada, for Father Truhu Dunya, the Ruh of Amir. Amir al muminin left his body. Amir al muminin went silent. He's not moving anymore. Zainab begins weeping. Hassan holds Zainab. Amir al muminin is lifeless. Zainab will die over here. Ma 
ماتم حیدر ماتم علی